Shalom, shalom, shalom. First and foremost, all praises and the blind is due to Yahweh by Hashem HaMashiach wa Malak Yahushai. Second of this brother, Yara Don W. Fat Detroit. Come back as we get another cold cut. Today in this cold cut, we'll be speaking about your emotions, right? More importantly, how to master your emotions and overcome them. Because especially in these last days, you will be placed in uncomfortable situations, you know, maybe, maybe even unfortunate situations where it's going to be you and the Lord and you have to ask yourself, well, how am I going to conduct myself, right? Because if you don't conduct yourself in the eyes of the Lord and by keeping the precepts in your mind, your emotions will arrive. In other words, you're going to be overthrown by your thoughts and your actions, right? Which is ultimately just your emotions getting the best of you. So through the spirit and power of Yahweh, how about Shemi Shai, Salakia, I gathered a plethora of precepts of our forefathers, you know, faced in certain situations. All right. Familial woes, um, jolly, telling the truth when it hurts, feeling threatened, financial woes, dealing with lust, along with jealousy. Right. And this is important to understand because, again, in these last days, Satan will try to overthrow you. He's going to do that by way of oppressing you at work, burdening you with schoolwork. You know, perhaps you may be in school um, dealing with a certain lady. You know, whatever the case is, Satan has a toolbox and he's going to throw everything at you. Whatever tool he can find, he will throw it at you. All right. But you have to remember that you can't be ignorant of his devices. So when you are facing these situations, you have to recall the precepts and call upon the name of the Lord. Or else, you know, you're going to let your emotions just take advantage of you. And then you're going to be in a far worse situation than the beginning. So again, you know, even as the scripture says, things were in the foretime, written for our learning and understanding now that we may have patience and comfort and hope, paraphrasing. But we'll get that precept as we uh, continue. But first, I do want to get uh, Proverbs 25 and uh, 28 to dive into it. Twenty-five and twenty-eight. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. That's plain upon tables. You know that's plain. If you have no rule over your spirit, I mean you're you're going to allow anything to come in. You're success susceptible. I believe that's the word. Um, you know, I would use, I would say you're vulnerable. Right. You're vulnerable to uh, spirits coming in and destroying you all because you have no rule over your spirit. And the best way to tame your spirit and your emotions is by recalling the precepts and again, calling upon the name of the Heavenly Father. That's the only thing that's going to deliver you um, from perils. So we'll get the first account in Genesis chapter 34, verse one. Don't think that you've been through this alone. I mean, again, this is, yes, the Bible contains our culture. It contains, you know, laws and feast days. And we see the Lord's judgment. But you also see accounts of your forefathers and foremothers going through similar predicaments as you. This is thousands of years ago. And it's still happening today. You know, before I get that, I'll get Romans. Um, what's that? Romans 15 and 4. For whatsoever things were written afore time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Right? So when you read and open up the book of the law and see accounts of your forefathers, your foremothers, you know, you're supposed to read it, acknowledge it, absorb it, Right? Take heed to it and apply it, right? And through application, it's like you, through application, that's how you become stronger and better. You know, for when you fall in certain situations, you apply the accounts and recall upon it. And remember how you're supposed to move. Because Esau in his world, they'll tell you, move like this, move like that. They'll give you terrible ass advice, awful counsel, God awful counsel. I think you should handle it like this. 
And it's completely contrary to what the Lord said. So that's why we're going to go straight out the scriptures. This is Genesis chapter 34, verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Right, he assaulted her. Right, sexually assaulted her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and he spoke kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. It's bad enough that he's a heathen. And he didn't even do it in the right order. He's supposed to go to Jacob first, but he lay with this woman, not knowing if she was promised or anything. Verse 5, And Jacob heard that he had to follow Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace. This is something, you know, Jake, you kind of read it, whatever, he held his peace. And then Hamor and the Shechem, father of Shechem, went on to the... No, you got to pause. You got to see how your forefathers reacted in certain situations. This is a certain familial role. He held his peace. If a heathen lay with your daughter, your only daughter that's a virgin... I mean, most Jacob Porter gone out. They, they'll shoot somebody. They want to beat his ass. And then they're in jail for 10 years. That's what happens when your emotions ride in certain situations. Right? In this case, familial woes. But it said Jacob held his peace. Jacob could have had something more clever in, in, um, in, in plan. Right? To overthrow these heathen. There's no telling. But, you know, if you know the story, then it went another direction. But, you know, again, you know, had, this, had that direction not happened, I mean, Jacob, he would have made some moves, some wise moves, right? But the point of the matter is he held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to, the, to Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob went out, uh, came out into the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in line with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done, right? And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longed for your daughter. I pray you, give her, him, to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. Now, through the Spirit, you will understand that Jacob and his sons, they perceived this to be a wicked thing. When you read Galatians 6, um, it's like it, Genesis the sixth chapter and the fifth verse one down, if I'm not mistaken, right? It's a shame for the sons of God to be married into the sons of um the children of men. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you, dwell and trade you therein, and get you possessions therein, right? So on and so forth. But nevertheless, we find that Jacob held his peace. Now, you know, that's not to say, you know, you can't be angry. That's not to say, you know, there's not a time and a place for everything. In fact, that's really what I uh, wanted to start with. That's why it's in, um, you know, in, in big font. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. Because on a spiritual level, there's a time and a place for everything. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the sun. A time to be born and time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up. That which is planted. And we'll jump down to verse 3. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. And that's looked over. You know, perhaps you may have lost the woman that you were courting. It's a time to lose. Most I didn't want you to be with that woman. You know, he may have wanted you to be with her for a certain dispensation of time, just so you may gain some lessons. You know, or perhaps it may be the other way around. There's a time to lose in this thing. A time to rent and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time to war and a time of peace. And at this particular moment, we find that Jacob he held his peace, which was righteous. 
You know, our demon would be uh, it's like you. His peace is counted for righteousness. You know, is Jacob. We can't say he's a fool for keeping his peace. We can't say he's a fool for for um, holding his patience, because as it says in Luke twenty one and nineteen, which we'll get further in the video, um, in thy patience possesses yea your soul. You know, and that's before all. That's before anything. The Lord said, in your patience possesses ye your soul. So let's get Ephesians 4 and 26. The land me back off Ecclesiastes. Because again, you know, I, I'm not here to say, you know, be a, be stoned face all day 24-7. There's a time and a place for everything. Surely we have to understand that. So let's get Ephesians. Four and twenty-six. The let me back off Ecclesiastes. Because the Lord said, Be ye angry and sin not. So there's nothing wrong with being angry. There's nothing wrong with having emotions and feeling, but don't let it override and destroy yourself and overthrow you. Again, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So there's nothing wrong with being angry. There's nothing wrong with being sad. And in fact, in Sirach, I believe the 21st chapter and or the 7th chapter, tell us to mourn. And in Sirach 39, uh, uh, if I, I believe, or 38, it tells us that, you know, we got to mourn. Even Esau, the wicked, the wicked ass devil, even he mourned for his father. So again, there's nothing wrong with feeling these emotions, but you can't let it destroy yourself. And that's the main objective that we have to understand in this video. So we'll get another um, example of fa familial woes. We'll get the book of Tobit, chapter 2, verse 10. And it reads, and I knew not this, knew not there, it's like, and I knew not that there were sparrows in the wall. And mine eyes being opened, the sparrows muted warm dung into my eyes. And a whiteness came in my eyes, and I went to the physicians, but they helped me not. Moreover, Acharacius did nourish me until I went to Elimias, and my wife Anna did take woman's work to do. And there's no telling their exact dynamic and how he ran his household, but, you know, one event followed after the other. You know, one can um, righteously assume that Anna probably didn't do any work, right? But we find that she did or um, that this is happening and taking place right after he's blind and he can't, you know, he, he's limited to doing certain work. Verse 12, and when she had sent him, it's like and when she had sent them home to the owners, they paid her wages and gave her also beside a kid. For those who don't know, a kid is an actual, you know, child, but that's um, rather a name for a baby goat. And when it was in mine house and began to cry, I said unto her, from whence is this kid? You know, you really have to paint the picture and, you know, input yourself in a situation as if you were there. You understand? Tobit's blind. He's hearing a cry from a goat. He's like, what the hell's going on? Is not this fault? It's like it is it not falling. Render it to the owners. He didn't examine matter. He was just upset. You know, you can tell through the spirit. He didn't say render it to the owners. Uh, he didn't say for whence is this kid. There's emotion behind his voice. All right. This is one of the uh, an account of an argument between spouse, uh, two spouses, right, or a husband and a wife in the scriptures. For it is not lawful to eat anything that is stolen. I mean, he's just assuming. <laughs> he's just assuming that it's stolen, right? Now, you know, perhaps he may have been under stress. He's upset he can't really do what he needs to do because of his uh, blindness. But she replied unto him upon him, it was given for a gift more than the wages. Howbeit, I did not believe her. He still didn't believe her, but bade her <laughs> to render it to the owners. So he said, again, give it back. Anna, give it back. And I and I was abashed of her. But she repl replied upon me, 
where are thine arms? And this is a righteous um, dialogue. She's not, you know, speaking back in wickedness. She's not being a wicked woman. Is she speaking the truth? You know, because in a marriage, you can be the man in the house and there's nothing wrong with that. And you have to provide spiritually, emotionally, or, you know, spiritually, financially, and, you know, whatever else may fall. But that'll make you always right. You understand? You can't be that guy. I'm always right. I don't have to listen to my wife. Hey, that's what a help meet is for. She helps you, right? And this is an account of Anna being a help meet. And she says, are thine own? Where are thy arms? So I can. Where are thine arms? And thy righteous deeds, behold, thou and all thy works are known. She said, All your works are known. So, you know, although they have. So, like, so although they have familial woes, we find um, what's the resolution. And that's remembering that the Lord blesses us, the Lord watches over us at the end of the day. Which is why she said, Were thine alms and thy righteous deeds, they are made manifest, they're known before you. So remember that, you know, the most high will still bless you, even in your troubles, even in you being blind, deaf, dumb, mute, even spiritually, perhaps. You know, you may not be able to see some, but the Lord is blessing you. You know? So let's get another account. This is Amos chapter 7, verse 11. This is Amos speaking to the king, Amaziah. It's like not Amaziah, but Jeroboam. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam, shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their land of their own land. Now if you think a king is just some mortal, you know, he they are a mortal man, but if you think they're just some nigga, I mean you're surely you're mistaken. Read second Ezra, uh, was at the third chapter, or first Ezra, the third chapter, right? And find out and understand how strong the king is and how much power he has. Um, let me see, it's first Kings it's like you, I'm saying Kings, first Ezra. Yeah, first Ezra's the uh the fourth chapter. Yeah, fourth chapter. Right? And you'll find out how strong the king is. So, you know, take that in consideration as you read. That's what Amos said to the king, you're going to die by the sword. Also, Amaziah said unto <laughs> to Amos, O thou seer. For those who don't know, a seer is a prophet. Go flee thee away into the land of Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there. In other words, get the hell out of my face. But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto the to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the words of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, that said the Lord. And he said, Yeah, I hear you. You saying that? You saying don't drop the word? And look, you know this is Amos telling the truth when it hurts. You know it's lies on the line. The king could have said, servant, fall upon him. His life is on the line. He's here to tell the truth when it hurts. And sometimes you got to tell the truth when it hurts. You know, despite with the um, despite the repercussions or whatever else may fall upon you, you still got to tell the truth when it hurts. So this is a beautiful account of Amos remaining strong and fervent in the spirit of the Lord. You know, he's not letting his emotions ride because he's a... There's no respect to persons, by the way. So he's not let his emotions rile. He's a king. I'm scared. Um, hey, uh, Jeroboam, you gotta die. He didn't whisper it, and he said it boldly. You know. So remember that. You know, when you're in a certain position or situation, tell the truth even when it hurts. That doesn't mean be an asshole and speak your mind freely. Excuse my language. Excuse my language. But that doesn't mean be a jerk and speak your mind freely all the time. Because a fool uttereth his mind, but 
tell the truth, you know, when you have to tell the truth, you know, have some integrity. Despite the repercussions, don't be scared of what may fall upon you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in a city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by the line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. A ap again, after the king said leave, he didn't go nowhere. He didn't go nowhere. He could have okay, king, you got it. You got it, man. You got it, Ak. Hey, he... You want in a slavery. Your wife's going to be a harlot. And he kept laying down a word. You know? So, you know, at times you got to tell the truth when it hurts, even when you're feeling threatened. Right? And that's a beautiful transition to the next uh, verse. Or it really ties into it. Which is uh, Matthew 16. 23. It's like you. Yeah, that ties into Matthew uh, 16, 23. Let's start at verse 22. Uh, 21. From that time forth began Yahweh to shew unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders of the chief priests, scribes, it's so like the priests and scribes, and be killed and be risen again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be afar from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So this is uh, obviously, you know, Satan jumped on Peter because Satan's job is to prevent, you know, the righteous from doing what they need to do, right, on a spiritual level. And you know that Satan jumped on Peter by uh, by Yahweh's response. But he turned to said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. On a, He wasn't calling him Satan because, you know, he was upset at him or mad. Satan is on Peter. That's why in certain accounts you would read that Satan entered him or Satan, uh, an evil spirit fell upon Saul. Satan will jump on you, right? And take advantage of uh, your emotions. So again, but he turned it to Peter and said, it's like you be he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. You know, and this is what Yahweh said to his best friend, to Peter, right? He loved Peter. And, and guess what he said? You know, it could be behind me, Satan. And that goes hand in hand when, uh, with Amos 7 11 and telling the truth when it hurts. You know, not to say it hurt at Yahweh, but in most cases, it may hurt your friend uh, or hurt you to get on your friend sometimes. But, you know, at the, at the same point, who cares? Sometimes the truth is needed, uh, is is meant to be heard, despite your feelings. You know, the truth isn't here to cater to your feelings. So you know, when you're feeling threatened, you know you can't rely upon your uh, your emotions. Because on another side of the coin, you know, um, Peter pulled out his sword, all because he was going to take his friend. He felt threatened. So this is a beautiful um, uh, account for us to remember, even in the tightest situations where things are inevitable, I mean, we just got to deal with it. Certain consequences or perhaps just unfortunate situations may fall upon us. You got to deal with it and understand that the Lord is going to have your back. So let's get uh, one precept in Acts 7 and 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked upon, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And how shall I stand on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran up upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness 
laid down their uh, clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, or Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord, Yahweh shall receive my spirit. So in a time of his affliction, you know, when he's feeling threatened, or in a time of, you know, and they're being, you know, somebody trying to kill you, you know, he called upon the name of the Lord. How many times do you call upon the name of the Lord when you're feeling threatened? You know, I just noticed we skipped one. That was Second Kings. We'll go back to it. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. Right. So this is deep. That's very deep. He didn't let his emotions get to him. Now, there's times in um, Jeremiah, we may see his emotions getting to him. But afterwards, he understood, you know, in Jeremiah 20 and 8, you know, afterwards, he understood how um, how the Lord has him at the end. Let me go back to 2 Kings. Twenty and thirteen. Right, I brought um, I'm I wrote jolly because, you know, you don't always have to be jealous, or have lust, or um, deal with financial woes, to uh, to let your emotions destroy you. Sometimes even through your jollity, you can um have your emo you can have it's like you can have your emotions destroy you even during your happy uh points. You make it confident in a plain way. You make it prideful. So even in you being jolly, you know, you, you can't even let that destroy you. So again, you have to master your emotions. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and shewed them the house of the precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointments and all the, the house of his armor. And all this was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah shewed of them not. Then came Isaiah, prophet unto the king, and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They came from Babylon. It's like from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All things that are mine. House have they seen? There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. He said, I got some... <laughs> He said, hey, I got something for you. Behold, the days come that all that is in thy house and that which thy fathers have laid up to store up upon this day, until this day, shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. You know, because even on a carnal level, like it says in right, 11 and 29 on down, you don't want to let a, um, any man into your house, you know, or you're going to be destroyed. Bring not every man into thine house, for the deceitful man hath brought many trains, in other words, snares and traps. You know, it also says in um, Sarah 32 and 21, be not confident in a plain way. Your confidence can overthrow you. Your jolly, your jollity can overthrow you. I'm not going through no tribulation. I got money in my pocket. I'm good. At that moment, you get destroyed. All right? We got uh, two more. We wind it down. Wind it down. Genesis 39. Might have to do a part two. We'll see. 39 and 4. This one is pertaining to lust, which is something everybody struggles with. And lust isn't always sexual. Lust can be a lust for money, greed, uh, jealousy, or it's like your money, power, notoriety, you know. But I digress. This is Genesis 39 and 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And that's deep. The most I may bless the heathen just so he can in turn really bless you. 
So that's something um, to remember as well. 